It's the 100 year anniversary since this man was killed in battle in Mesopotamia. His parents were Armenians. He was killed on April the 11th, 1917. Um, his name is Haran Baronian. Haran was my mother's second cousin. Mother never met him, but she knew Haran's brothers and sister Dolly very, very well. Dolly lived here in Nutsford for many years and mother looked after her when she was old and used to come over once a week. That statue has made him that the one boy immortal, hasn't it? So what he tried to do by, by trying to commemorate his son has meant he has lived down. Yeah. And here we are but, now we are talking about him. But the funny thing is, um, there's a letter has come to light from Dolly from 1977 and when she writes that um, Zara did this unilaterally and all the Nun's family would have wanted it and she wrote, and Haran would have hated it oh, really? and underlined hated and then she wrote, oh, he was not that kind of person. Oh, that's, is, so that's he was fantastic. very modest, right? I think Zara yeah. was a lot about status. He was, he was, all yeah. ego, yeah. Oh, it is. That's and, you fantastic. Know, and, and it's not only what he can do for his son, but the fact yeah. that he could afford. So Haran wouldn't have wanted it. No. There were Armenian communities in European countries, including in England, uh, who were pr predominantly merchant class. These were people who had merchant houses in places like Manchester, uh, Constantinople, Smyrna, and going all the way to the Far East, places in India. And these people were fabulously rich. Haran's story begins with his father, whose name was Zara Eplitsian. And he was born in Smyrna around 1865. Um, we think he came over to the UK probably around sometime in the 1880s. My grandfather, that's my mother's father, Nersesku Benkiel, came in the 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century. He came from where all the, or the, where the majority of the Gulbenkian family came from Caesarea. And uh, he established a business here, a commodity broking business in the city of London and he spent the rest of his life, no it's not quite true, he spent a large part of his life in London until he eventually retired. He went to Llandidno. In the course of the 19th century the Armenian community started to challenge <coughs> its own status in the Ottoman Empire uh, what we would call a civil rights movement today. It was for, for equality with their Muslim kith and kin. At a time when the empire was also in decline, when in the Balkans other Christian people were rebelling for their independence, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania. So the, <clears throat> it was a turbulent period. Um, unfortunately for Armenians, the Ottoman response at the time under Abdul Hamid Sultan, Abdul Hamid uh, II, uh, was one of massacre. So one of the biggest massacres that Armenians ex experienced in the modern era was in the 1890s when the Ottoman Empire or the Ottoman Sultan resorted to mass violence pitting Muslim against Christian or Muslims against Armenians and hundreds of thousands of them were, were massacred and that <clears throat> spurred on the first movement of Armenians out of the Ottoman Empire into Europe, into Russia. Um, so there were political refugees and People just left for their own security. My, fam my paternal family come from Diyarbakir, which is in southeastern Anatolia, which is in southeast Turkey. And uh, at the time when they were living there, it was under the Ottoman Empire regime. It's now Turkey. I'm third generation. Uh, on my, I'm the granddaughter of Yervant Hovanis Zorian. And he was about 10 years old when he and his mother fled Diyarbakir and came to uh, the United Kingdom in 1897. So the stories that I know are from an oral tradition and from my grandfather who told my father who then told me. What we do know that happened for sure is that the military police came to the house and raided it. 
and they took away lots of books, but they also found lots of music. Now, Samuel had taught himself European music notation, which the authorities, the Turkish authorities, didn't understand, so they thought it was code of some sort. They also took away uh, and found and took away uh, sheet music, which had Christian hymns on it, one of which was Onward Christian Soldiers, which to anybody from the outside would seem like a very strong revolutionary song. So he and Kavork, his elder brother, were arrested. And that's when the trouble began. Kavork um, worked in the telegraph office and was, had, was a linguist. So he was, quite, he was highly thought of, and so he was released quite quickly. The wheels turned that was, he was able to, to leave. And when he came back, he sort of got things moving in the family to leave, because he could see the writing on the wall. He just knew that things were going pear-shaped for the Armenians in that community. Samuel is now released from prison. Kavork leaves. He heads to um, England because of connections within with the Christian church and also because of the, uh, the textile community um, that Samuel had been involved with. So they go to Manchester and he takes Helen and their two young children and they start, start to pave the way for, the, for Samuel and for Sarah and my grandfather, um, Yervant, to go. So by 1901, they're both living in the UK and they've got three boys by now. Stepan, who was born in 1894, Haran, who was born in 1896, and then they had Isaac, who was born in 1901. So three boys, successful business, Zara's doing really well for himself. The Armenian presence in the United Kingdom, it has a history of its own, but after a while that presence becomes an Armenian presence of British Armenians. They are as British as they are Armenians, and Armenians became contributing members to British life uh, as great tradesmen, industrialists, and even during World War I, many Armenians lost their lives fighting for what was their country, the United Kingdom or Great Britain. Living in Manchester, Kavork had another five children, but one of them was killed, uh, young Joseph was killed in the First World War. He was born in, in England, so he would be conscripted, where um, the two elder brothers were actually, often, they were Turkish, so they couldn't have been. And how difficult it must have been for these two young men living in Manchester when all the other young men are going off to war and they wouldn't have been able to join. I, I'm surprised they weren't interned, to be honest. But uh, I think it must have been extremely difficult for them. Haran didn't join the army immediately. He didn't join until 1916. I believe that he attested on the 10th of December. And we think the motivation was probably because of the fact that they realised by this time that the war wasn't going to be over very quickly. I believe that either at least one of Haran's classmates at university had been killed. And you get the feeling that he was, he was a dutiful young man. And at this stage, he decided that it was time for him to join the army. He was posted in June 1916. He was posted to Mesopotamia. And they said that they have found out that there is a member of the family who served in the uh, First World War for the British Army and was killed in the First World War and his name was Krikor Gulbenkian, and he was the son of Garabed, and that Garabed was the brother of Nerses, my grandfather, and two other brothers. So then I could see exactly where he fitted in. So he is, he's my cousin, but he's my great uncle's son. He'd only been out there a couple of months, and he wasn't actually fighting. He was actually, he was an engineer, and so he'd been sent out to uh, repair uh, the guns, and so he, he wasn't even, you know, he was a fusilier, he was, wasn't fighting. He was just hit by a shell. Haran was wounded, he was shot in the hand in February 1917. Um, he was taken to hospital, um, spent a bit of time recuperating, then went back to the front. And unfortunately he was, he was shot on the 11th of April 1917. Um, 
by all accounts, it was a stomach wound um, and he was killed. Oh, and then these are when the boys went to war. No, so this is that? Stephen, he's the... Um, he's, Did he survive? He's, yes. He's the, he's the eldest brother. Right. So he was born in 1894. And he survived, but he was shot in the left thigh by a sniper. Right. And so he was permanently disabled. It was a compound oh. um, fracture of the femur. So, but he survived. All that's, good looking lads. That's Harren, who is Very the handsome. one for the memorial. Oh. And this is him as well. And they were these, these two are his two oh. official war photographs before he went off to oh, war. Right. And I mean, he lasted 10 months before he was killed. I believe so, it was pretty gruesome. That's, oh, lovely. that's just a comparison of oh, the gosh. memorial with with Harren, three quarter view. And, I mean, the sculptor, we were talking about it earlier on, he hasn't got the eyes, which are impossible to get, mm. but the nose and the chin and the mouth are, mm. are, are quite, quite Very fabulous. Very nice. And the, you know when he's looking, is he taking his cap off? No, or he's, is he? No, he's actually, he's shielding his eyes because the reason that oh. he's shown like that is the last time his parents saw him, he was going to the train station to go to war mm -hmm. and the sun was shining and he was looking for them. Oh. And so when his father chose the, the pose, it's Harren seeing just, his you know, oh, parents sad. for the last time. And, I just, and this is the thing that really sort of freaked me out because obviously he was in the garden and he was, they're not sure, I, I don't know where he I was. I don't you know, know, I have I no idea. And, and I think it's impossible to say, but mm. they would have had him facing, I'm sure, towards the house. Yeah. And to me, you know, as a mother, Mm. I would have almost have felt like every time I looked out of the window and if I could see him, then you'd have felt, felt so he was coming home. There. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. And it was, must have been awful for them to have come from where they'd come from, to have seen the atrocities they'd seen, to have made that effort and then to lose their boy in, in another war. You know, it must have just, you know, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Yeah. So no wonder they, they left. <laughs> radical wing of the so-called Young Turk movement took over the Ottoman Empire. These were the sort of racist Turkish nationalists who eventually ended up destroying Armenians during World War I, but also Assyrians and Greeks. And the genocide, of course, was either had left the Armenians with two, two choices. They either died or fled. Those who fled and survived ended up places like Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, what is today's Armenia in the Caucasus. But again, during World War I, many of them tried to come to the United Kingdom. The British were not welcoming, but there were pro-Armenian groups in the United Kingdom. There was a pro-Armenian movement in the United Kingdom. Some MPs gave vociferous support to Armenians, and a, a trickle of them managed to come to the United Kingdom. My grandfather, the father of my mother, was in the Turkish army, Ottoman army. Strangely enough, it was yeah, and uh, he reached even uh, Palestine with the army, fighting the, the other groups, other Armenians who were in the army against the Turkish army. Unfortunately, yeah, later on he got 50 farakas, as they say. They beat on his feet, Under just like that, yeah. and because they wanted, because he was in the army, they thought that <coughs> he must have many, uh, 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 let's say, um, arms and um, uh, whatever he could give them, but he had no arms. It's, it's well, my dad was called Dikran Kacharyan, and um, he was born in a village in. Um, Eastern Turkey, which is now Eastern Turkey, it was Western Armenia, um, called Shabin Khairasar. And it was a very unhospitable place, quite high up in the mountains. Apparently for six months of the year they couldn't leave the house because the snow was uh, blocking the streets and so they used to cook all summer and keep their food underground. So they had a quite a difficult life there. He was 12 when his family were all killed. He was in school, he was the oldest of five boys and 
he didn't want to be a farmer, they were farmers. And he was always saying to his dad, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a lawyer. And he taught himself to read and write when he was very young, there was no school in this place. Parents used to teach their children, but he learned English. He taught himself to learn English and he'd translate for the village. People would bring letters that they had and stuff like that. And when he was about 12, his dad said, okay, you can go to school. And they sent him to a boarding school which was in a big town. I don't know what the town was called. And while he was there, he'd only been there about six months, they had a terrible massacre and his whole village was wiped out. What year was that? This was in 1915, I think June 1915. The massacre started in April, May um, throughout that area, but I think his village um, was wiped out in, in June. And that meant, of course, that he had nobody. He lost his mother, his father, his four younger brothers. His youngest brother was two years old. Um, and it's written about in, um, there's a book called The Treatment of the Armenians by the Ottoman Empire by Bryce and Toynbee. And um, it says that in Shavin Kharas, that every last man, woman and child was killed by the sword. So my mother was born in Erzurum. And during the massacres, 1914, she was just three years old. And um, all we know is she had a, a brother, uh, older or younger, I'm not sure. She was just holding on to this brother. And, uh, and they, were, they got separated. The neighbours, I think the neighbours, took, took, in, took in her and the brother, I don't know what happened, or she doesn't know anything about the brother. She doesn't remember nothing. And uh, she remembers that, uh, or she was told later on that uh, it was um, um, uh, missionaries. Mm. It was the missionaries. I remember as being the Swiss missionaries. Um, they were collecting the children of Armenian yes, uh, families that true. they were uh, massacred. And uh, so they brought her, her journey was um, they brought her to Lebanon and from Lebanon in an orphanage, of course. And from there, of course, uh, when she got older, she got married to my father. And that, that is, that's all I know. And all I know is, um, again, it's very traumatic, is um, uh, all her life she was looking for her brother. He had a cousin who um, knew what had happened to the family in the village and she contacted his school and begged them not to tell him what had happened there and said that um, to the school tell him that his father wants him to go to England to study English which is what he wanted to do anyway and he can study to become a lawyer there so it sounds a little bit far-fetched but that's what I heard from him and from other people who knew him which was like a, the only other person who knew him was this little old lady that we used to call a queenie and that's who he went to live with in London so they sent him to London because in those days although there was um, refugees went to other places for those that escaped the massacres and the marches some of them went to Lebanon others went to France others went to um, parts of Greece but in England, they weren't accepting refugees from Armenia. So I think they made a special case for him because he had nobody there. And he had a relative here, that's Queenie's husband. We used to call him Mr. Pashayan, um, who was a clockmaker. And he lived in Inderwick Road in Crouch End. So that's where my dad was sent. And he didn't know these people, obviously, but they were, I think they were cousins of cousins. They were the closest relatives he had, really, that he could live with. So that was in 1915 he came here. Cavalk was very much involved with um, giving talks about the Armenian plight, which are recorded, and it's, um, I say recorded, recorded in the press. So there are newspaper articles um, saying that this is what he, he did, he gave these talks. Um, raising funds for the Armenians, um, yeah, and and they did concerts as well, raising money for the Armenians who were refugees. So they were very, very involved in 
um, in the link and in making sure that A, there was knowledge of what was going on, and B, that there was money and resources for, for the Armenians. And remember that their cousins would still have been in Diyarbakir, and we don't, don't have no idea what happened to them. There's no record of them at all. So Sarah had to leave her brothers and sisters when she left. When he was 15, um, they told him properly what had happened. He was writing to his family in Shabin Khair Asar, and they never got any letters back. And they were saying, well, it's the war, which it was, because it was during the First World War, and letters didn't go and come as you know efficiently as they do when there's no war. So. Um, I think he kind of wanted to believe the story, that probably he knew, because Queenie um, told me one day, I was a child really, I was about 10 or 11, she said that, because um, we found out a lot from her, she said that when she used to make his bed in the mornings, it, his pillow was always wet from crying. I suppose why they took on the, the responsibility of letting people know and, and, and the cause, because they had, they had gone early. They had had the foresight. So in a way, music caused, uh, caused trouble for the Armenians, but actually it saved their life. Oh, the Armenian for our family it caused problems for us because of going back to Samuel, who learnt European notation, but it actually saved their life. Because if that hadn't happened, we'd have been still there. <laughs> learned English very quickly, he used to go to night school and um, he was apprenticed with a carpet dealer in London. There was quite a lot of carpet dealers in London. Some of them were Armenian, some of them were Persian or Iranian, others were Turkish. There was quite a big community of um, and, you know, antique carpet dealers. They dealt with handmade oriental carpets. And he started working there when he was very young, and he had very good aptitude for repairing. My father was born in Izmir in Turkey, and he fled with his family. The, the fire of Smyrna in 1920, when there were a lot of Armenians were massacred at that time, and he with his family managed eventually to come to London, and the reason they chose London was because he had my, cousin, my mother's family living here who were distant cousins. He never talked about what happened to him to me. He used to, odd times I used to see him with a tear in the corner of his eye on a, you know, in the evening sometimes when he'd sit and think and, you know, my mum would sort of leave him alone a bit because he needed that time. But other than that, he didn't really speak of it much at all. My family, as I said earlier, would not talk about it. I could not get them to talk. My grandmother who witnessed some horrific things, I believe, would not say anything. And I also believe, but of course I was told by someone else, that a member of the family, and I, I don't know who, actually died during those massacres. Because I have a photograph of all my family, well, I say on my father's side, with one other person in that photograph, who no one will even mention. I don't even know who his name is, but I, I've since not found out, but I believe that this, this, in, this mysterious person in that photograph was either another brother or was a very close cousin, or certainly a member of the family, who was killed during the massacres. And because it was so painful for them, they wouldn't talk about it. Cave Hawk was a very religious man. Um, and so I, I think he was always looking for reconciliation. I think um, uh, so because it's so. I, I, I and I, he played in the, the local organ in uh, um, in Romilly, and uh, I've been there, and it's the same organ that was there. Just <laughs> extraordinary. Um, uh, so I, I think they felt they've always felt it was their duty. That was something that Yervant, my grandfather, felt. He felt that this home, this this country had given them a uh, sanctuary, had given them a new life, and therefore they owed a debt of gratitude. And they, so they felt very strongly on that level, they felt strongly. 
I don't think they felt that they were fighting the Turks on as a kind of um, proxy <laughs> proxy war. I think they felt they were doing the right thing, um, hard as it was, because they lost their boy. He loved England. He was people used to say more English than the English. He didn't have an Armenian accent. He spoke quite plum. His accent was. And he wrote beautifully in English, and he used to go and do presentations and talks about Armenia, um, you know, for um, organisations would call him, because in those days it was quite um, rare to meet an Armenian. People didn't really know much about Armenia. Even when I was at school, um, people hadn't heard of Armenia. He was never bitter. He was always smiling. He was very philosophical. You know, he didn't have like a chip on his shoulder about it at all. And I think that's how he dealt with it. He kind of put it away, you know, and um, never talked about it. Kalus bought a house in Kensington when he moved to London, then moved north of the park to Hyde Park. So it seemed to be the area that... And then Kalus built a church. In the St. Sarkis church is, is in Kensington as well a big focal point because the church is a very important aspect of Armenian life. It's held the Armenians together in many ways. And he built that church when he built it. I believe there was about maybe 20 Armenian families in London. So it's a small church built in memory of his parents. His father's name was Sarkis, his mother's name was Navart. Um, and he, there's a memorial there for them and he thought it would be used by the small community, but the community has expanded since, and now there's another church, also in Kensington, South Kensington. So the British helped Armenians as much as they could, but they weren't necessarily welcoming in the British Isles itself. So there were some Armenians, but the numbers didn't necessarily augment. <clears throat> the real movement, if I may continue, uh, of Armenians in the United Kingdom took place much later than that, um, especially in 1950s. Uh, when the Cyprus problem <coughs> uh, started and many Armenians started moving from Cyprus to the United Kingdom, 1950s and 60s. And then with the uh, 1970s, there's another wave of Armenians came, refugees from Lebanon, from the Lebanese Civil War, uh, Iranian ref uh, Armenians from Iran after the Iranian Revolution. So you had wave after wave of Armenians coming with their own narratives, with their own specific stories to the United Kingdom. And that sort of explains why the British Armenian community has a, shall we say, is it, segmented into different groupings because they all came from different parts of the Middle East over a, over a hundred year period. But World War I was a decisive moment for all of them because the Lebanese Armenians who came here or uh, Armenians from Cyprus initially, of course, started with an exodus from Turkey itself, fleeing for the genocide during World War I.